Lord Jesus, the most precious Holy Spirit, we come before you this day, gathered in your house, to worship you, to hear from you, to sing your praises, to fellowship, even at a distance, with these, your people. We come, Father, with excitement and joy because we are together as a family, worshiping the one who loves us so. We ask, Lord, that while we're here, that you touch us, and that you change us, that you help us to become more and more and more like Jesus each and every day of our lives. It's in your holy and glorious name that I pray these things. Amen. Now if you'll turn to 348, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5 of My Savior's Love.
Father, we come before you once again this morning, and we lift up your holy name. The only name worthy of praise, the only name worthy of our adoration, the only name worthy of our worship. We lift up your name, Father, and we say that we love you, that we trust you, and that we desire for you to intervene in our lives. Desire for you to intervene, Father, for those on our hearts and minds, those on our prayer lists, those who are suffering. Whether it's grief from the loss of loved ones, whether it's suffering somehow related to this pandemic, whether it's suffering due to financial struggles or relationship issues or any other illness we can name, Father, whatever the struggle is, your word teaches us that your grace is sufficient. That doesn't mean that all of our struggles and problems fall away, but it does mean that you're right there with us, walking with us, and somehow, some way, we can find peace and hope in your presence. So Father, that's what we ask this morning as we lift up hundreds and hundreds of folks within our circle of friends and influence that stand in need of prayer. We lift them up, Father, and we ask that you bring hope and healing into their lives. We lift them up and we ask that you bring peace and comfort into their lives. The Father, as I'm praying for them, I'm also praying for us, but we need that same hope we need that same peace and comfort, Father, so grant it to us as well. And Lord, we come before you recognizing how holy, how righteous, how flawless you are. And we're in awe. We're in awe so much so, that, Father, it forces us to acknowledge that we are not those things. We are not flawless, in fact, we are flawed. We are not holy, in fact, we are often unholy. We are not righteous because, in fact, we are often unrighteous. So, Father, we want to pause now. And we confess all of these things to you. We confess our imperfections, our flaws, our, our unholiness, our unrighteousness. We confess our sins. We ask, Father, that you forgive us of our sins that you take the blood of Christ and that you wash those sins away and so we can stand before you the remainder of this day, the remainder of this worship service, so we can stand before you pure and holy, so that we can worship you in spirit and truth, so that we can open ourselves up to you in complete trust and allow you to change us in the very image of your Son, our Lord and Savior. And that you would please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our invitation to give generously this morning found in the Gospel of Luke. And these are the words of Jesus. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Let us now honor God.
your faithfulness, for your generosity, for the fact that you are ever giving in our lives. I praise you, Father, that these, your people, respond the way you do. Generous, ever giving into the life of this congregation. Lord, for the offerings that have been received this week, whether they be placed in these plates as we come and go or, or mailed in, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless these offerings and multiply them so that there is enough to do everything you've called us to do and even leftovers. And Lord, I thank you that you have created such a generous spirit in this congregation. May you bless them in their ever endeavor for you. In your holy name. Amen. You may be seated as you do so. Please come as you come down and offer a childless children's Jesus' death and our faith. Isaiah 43 1 tells us, Don't fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. But then there's another kind of fear there's earthly fear. This fear does not come from God, and it tells you horrible messages that are Satan's lies. It can say, I can't, God won't. Nobody cares. I don't matter. And it's too late. And it makes you feel bad, right? But you know what? When we feel that way, we can go back to the Bible and we can show those things as lies. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Jesus Christ. He's got our back. Oops. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God because he's listening. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And lastly, Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Bible says those are lies. And so we can live in faith in God. I'm going to close with a prayer. Lord, through you we know that courage is not being free from fear, but being full of spirit in you. That you will prepare us for everything that you put before us, and no matter how hard it is, we can trust and know that we are never alone when we have faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
along the lines of the question Donna asked a moment ago, have you ever been truly afraid? So afraid that you were almost paralyzed? So afraid that words stuck in your throat and you wanted to scream, but you could not? In his book, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat, Pastor John Ortberg tells a story about a hot air balloon ride that he and his wife once took. The balloon party consisted of the Ortbergs, the pilot, and another couple. Ortberg had assumed that the baskets hanging beneath the hot air balloons were about chest high. However, the basket on this particular balloon was much, much lower than that, which greatly increased their fear. Ortberg writes that all four of the passengers Passengers hung on with grim determination and white knuckles. Perhaps you can relate to that. In an effort to calm his fears, Ortberg began to talk to the pilots, and he learned that this young man spent most of his time surfing and had only recently begun flying hot air balloons by accident, literally by accident. You see, a few months earlier, he had been driving after having too much to drink, and as a result, he had a wreck, severely injuring his brother. And during his recovery, his brother enjoyed looking out the window and watching the hot air balloons. So, he decided he would become a pilot so that he could guarantee that every day a hot air balloon would come over the rehab center for his brother to see. After he told that story, he said, by the way, if things get a little choppy on the way down, don't be surprised. I've never flown this particular balloon before, and I'm not sure how it's going to handle the descent. Now, at this point, Ortberg's wife, who had been silent the entire journey, she said with great emotion, you mean to tell me that we're a thousand feet in the air with an unemployed surfer who started flying hot air balloons because he got drunk, crashed his pickup truck, injured his brother, and he's never flown this balloon before, and he doesn't know how to bring it down. <laughs> Upon hearing the situation so powerfully reiterated, the husband of the other couple who also had remained silent throughout the whole trip said, or, 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 said, you're a pastor? Do something religious. So, Roger right, Ortberg, I took up an offering. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, Ortberg did not take up an offering. Nonetheless, we can most likely relate to the feeling of panic that those passengers experienced. We're out of control. It is beyond anything we can do. We have nothing but fear to keep us company when we ride. We've all been there, not in a hot air balloon perhaps, but there have been times when we have been really afraid for a variety of reasons. And I don't know about you, but it comforts me. It comforts me to read passages like our text for today where Jesus' closest disciples were afraid, with those who walked with him daily were afraid. They were even afraid when he was nearby and they could see him with their very eyes. That helps me to know that fear is, is natural in our lives and even natural in the lives of believers. So with all that said, I want to ask you to please stand and honor God's word. According to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. This is a very familiar passage as Matthew writes, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. By that time the boat, battered by the waves, was far away from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. 
But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But then he noticed the strong wind. He became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and called him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you yet again, and we ask now that you speak to us, speak to us clearly and plainly, speak to us in our hearts and in our spirit. Use my words if possible. If not, do what you do. Use the supernatural to touch and change us. In your holy, glorious name, I do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Instead of being in a hot air balloon, the disciples of Jesus were in a fishing boat, but their situation was just as perilous. It was some time after dark, and a severe storm had unexpectedly arisen. They were a considerable distance from land, and the wind was blowing fiercely, causing the boat to be ruthlessly pounded by the waves. And even in the hands of experienced sailors, like many of the disciples were, a boat on treacherous water can be frightening. So make no mistake about it, the disciples were scared, earnestly scared, and with each passing moment, with each wave that battered the boat, their fear increased and intensified. Then something extraordinary happened. Sometime in the middle of the night, going on towards morning, Long after the disciples should have made it to the other side, had put the boat up, had laid down and gone to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, Jesus came out to them in the middle of the lake. Not in another boat, instead walking on the water. Now normally, as you know, the presence, the presence, the presence of Jesus would have been reassuring. But this instance, it only added to their terror. They looked out in the dark, the wind, and the storm, and they're not exactly sure who it is. It could even be a ghost. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, Matthew tells us, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out, but immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Before we move on, I want to point out something very important, and that is that Jesus' words are for you and I, just as they were for the disciples that night in the midst of the storm. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Those words for us, are for us in the middle of a pandemic. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Those words are words for us as we are grieving the loss of a loved one. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Those are words for us as we're pondering how in the world we start back public school safely. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Whatever your storm in life may be, those words are directly for you. And for me. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. More often than not, I have discovered that fear is our biggest enemy. Have you ever made that discovery in your life? Fear itself is our biggest enemy. 
Former uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, in his first inaugural address, put it like this. He said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, that may not be the only thing we have to fear, but I'm reasonably sure that fear is our greatest fear. Biblically speaking, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Did you guess that? Fear. It is fear that often causes us to shrink back from our dreams. It is fear that sometimes help or sometimes keeps us unhappy and dissatisfied with ourselves, unable to manage meaningful change. Fear both blinds us and binds us. Blinds us and binds us. It blinds us to our possibilities binds us to the seemingly safe, sterile lives we have always lived. Fear both blinds and binds us. Zig Ziglar, in his book, Better Than Good, tells about the 2002 Winter Olympics when 16-year-old Sarah Hughes skated her way to a gold medal. Sarah stepped on the ice, not believing she had any chance to win any medal much less to go. With nothing to lose, she skated with reckless abandon, unconcerned about her score, the judges, or the audience. She just skated to skate. And as a result, she skated flawlessly. All tens. Michelle Kwan, who was expected to win the gold, followed Sarah on the ice that night. And because of Sarah's excellent performance, Michelle skated timidly, afraid to make a mistake. You ever been afraid to make a mistake? During her routine, Michelle fell and ended up not winning, ended up winning not the gold, but the bronze medal. Most people would be thrilled with that. She was extremely disappointed. Ziegler contends that while Sarah was focused on what to do, Michelle concentrated on what to avoid doing. That is what fear does to us. We fear failure, and the very act of fearing causes us to fail. For if we never try, we fail. If we try and are afraid to step out and do something different, we fail. We fear failure, and the very act of fearing causes us to fail. For example, many people fear sickness and death, and the weight of that worry actually increases the chances that illness will overtake them. You know what the number one killer in in the U.S. is today, and there's not any violence you ever heard of? Stress. You know what stress is? Worrying about our fears. Worrying about our fears. This is just one reason as to why Jesus' words to us are so important. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, what does not being afraid mean in practical terms? By that I mean, how do we overcome fear? Well, one way is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. In our text for today, Peter wanted to walk out on the water, no less, to meet Jesus. He wanted to go to Jesus so badly that he got out of the boat in the midst of the storm. I don't know about you, it'd be one thing to get out of the boat if the wind is calm and the water is smooth, but he got out of the boat in the midst of the storm, for it's after Jesus and Peter in the boat that the storm dies. He got out of the boat in the midst of the storm, and amazingly, Peter began to walk on the water. Can you not just see the other wide-eyed, jaw-drop disciples sitting in the boat, sitting in the boat, staring in, in bewilderment at Peter, thinking that he was crazy? Sure you can. Well, that's where he'd been, would it not? In fact, 
Most of the time, when we see somebody step out on faith, that's the way we look at them even now. Is it not? They're crazy. You want to do what? You want to go where? You want to minister to who? I'm making this up because this is the way they did this. They looked at him like he was crazy. Now, after taking a few steps on the water, as miraculous as that was, you would have thought him to skip the rest of the way to Jesus. But he didn't. After just a few steps on the water, Peter made the same mistake that we so often make. He took his eyes off Jesus. Taking his eyes off Jesus allowed Peter to look around at the wind and the waves, that is, to reflect on his circumstances. And when he did this, Peter began to sink. Somebody ought to write this down. We can either focus on our fear and our circumstances, or we can focus on Jesus. We cannot do both simultaneously. We can either focus on our fear and our circumstances, or we can focus on Jesus. We cannot do both simultaneously. Focusing on our fear will ultimately cause us to fail. While focusing on Jesus will eventually result in our succeeding beyond our wildest dreams. Who knows? We could even walk on water. Keep our eyes on Jesus, then move forward. Then move forward. That is, get out of the boat. For out of the boat is where astonishing things occur. Do you ever wonder how come things happen to other people? Man, did you see how God took care of them? You know why? They were out of the boat. Out of the boat. It is out of the boat where astonishing, even miraculous things occur. The Christian faith at its best is a call to adventure. It is a call to walk on water. We cannot walk on water if we are still in the boat. And oh, how we love the boat. We've even put cushions in the boat pews. I mean, in the boat seats. We love the boat. In the Old Testament, we see a people brought into existence by a command to Abraham to leave his home and go to a place which he had never been before. That is, God called Abraham to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Remember, genuine faith overcomes fear. And Abraham's faith was an overcoming faith because it was not static or passive. Instead, it was actively obedient to the will of God. Now notice in our text today, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if, if that's you, you still got some doubt here, is this a ghost or what? If that's you, bid me to come and I'll come. Jesus said, come on. Y'all remember that part of the story? When Jesus says, come on, don't sit back down in the boat. When Jesus says, come on, get in the water. What if you sink? He will pick you up anyway. Don't stay in the boat. But Jesus told his original disciples not to be afraid. He was not telling them to seek safety and security. Rather, Jesus was telling them to move forward and to always trust Him. And He is telling us the same thing. Do not be afraid to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Do not be afraid to get out of the boat. Back in the days when I used to take the Daily newspaper. I was a comic strip holic. And that's what I would read first with the comic session. I still miss the Sunday Fundies, but anyway. BC was the comic strip that was pretty popular at one time. I don't know if it's still in there or not, but BC is a character set, you know, before Christ. And, and so this one particular strip's got BC sitting there in his loincloth opening a box. And a letter inside the package reads, Congratulations! 
you have purchased the world's finest fire starting kit. The next frame shows BC reading more of the letter. The flint is of the finest stone imported from the Orient. Your striker has been handcrafted by old world craftsmen. The kindling has been carefully selected by screened lumberjacks. The last frame shows BC rubbing two sticks together trying to start a fire just like you'd always done. And a cave woman walks by, and there's always a cave woman walks by with something to say. The cave woman walks by and she asks him, Where's your new fire starting kit? BC responds, I build a shrine around it. I build a shrine. <coughs> the temptation for all of us is to say, Oh, yes. I trust Christ and then sit passively in our little comfort zone with the shrine surrounding our faith experience, doing things the way we have always done them. In other words, it is one thing to say we have faith, and it's another thing to get out of the boat. You see the difference, do you not? It is one thing to say we have faith. And it is another thing to get out of the boat and attempt to walk the water. By the way, <clears throat> that's true for individuals and congregations. And congregations are called to get out of the sanctuary, get out of this boat and into the community, the world, the neighborhood around us, to walk on some water and to share the good news. Christ is the answer to all of our troubles. Our culture has changed dramatically over the last few decades. You didn't need me to tell you that. But maybe you didn't know that some theologians suggest that we're now living in a post-Christian culture, a post-Christian culture, and therefore what was once effective in reaching the laws for Christ has lost its appeal. Congregations that successfully reach people today are the ones willing to take risks, who are willing to get out of the boat to share the gospel. These out-of-the-boat congregations, oh, listen to me really closely here. I don't want nobody to miss this. These out-of-the-boat congregations are willing to risk offending those who never want anything in the church to change. I need to say that again slowly. These out of the boat congregations are willing to risk offending those who never want anything in the church to change. That is, those who have built a shrine around their religious universe. With that in mind, I would suggest to you that it's the ones who cower in the boat who are most likely to retain their fear of the storm. But that's it. It is those who cower in the boat, who refuse to get out of the boat, who retain, who keep, who hang on to their fear of the storm. It is the ones who seek the safe and easy route, who tremble when the strong winds begin to blow. Keep our eyes on Jesus, then move forward, and do not be afraid. Try something new. Did you catch that part? Do not be afraid to try something new. Peter was not afraid to attempt something new. He had never walked on water before. That was a brand new experience for him. He was not afraid to try something new, new, and he was willing to risk failure. That is, he was not afraid to live out his faith. Not afraid to get out of the boat, even if that meant that he might get wet. You ever been around somebody in the swimming pool and you splash them and they bust because you got them wet? Ain't that some of the silliest things you ever heard? But it happens all the time. You say, and by hand, you go to pool. Happens all the time. We're not going to spread with the church. Try to do something different, you won't get us wet. 
We don't want to be wet. We'll stay dry. We like our little shrine. Don't get it wet. It might shrink. It might crack. It might rot. Don't get on the shrine wet. I think Jesus loved Peter's unbridled boldness. Now, granted, Peter could stick his foot in his mouth, but I still think Jesus loved Peter's unbridled boldness. And furthermore, I think Jesus would love to see that same buoyancy in us. It is that willingness to get wet because we know that he'll keep us afloat. I think we appreciate that same buoyancy in us. Confidence in Christ is not self-induced, but rather it is Jesus' gift to us. Take courage in his eye. Do not be afraid. In her book, Heartstrings, Jill Briscoe tells about a little girl on a train. The other passengers were entertained by this friendly youngster who seemed to be quiet at home with everyone in that train car. In fact, people began to wonder, wonder just who her mother and father is. She seemed so comfortable with everybody. Suddenly, the train gave a shrill whistle as it prepared to enter a long, dark tunnel, causing the little girl to become very anxious. She then ran down the aisle and threw herself into the open arms of the young man seated in the rear of the train. At that moment, there was no doubt in anyone's mind as to whom this child belonged. She was instantly happy and safe in her father's arms. Though she was still in the tunnel, still in the dark, her joy was evident and overflowing. The moment Peter began to sink, he cried out, and instantly Jesus took him by the hand. You think Peter's joy got washed away? I imagine he told everybody to listen the rest of his life about those few steps he took on the way. In fact, he may have said it so much people aboard that they don't know. His joy and excitement remained. Throughout their lifetimes, the disciples entered multiple dark tunnels. Jesus' crucifixion obviously being the darkest one. And like Peter, there were times that each of them had a occasion to cry out, Lord, save me. And like this determined disciple, they felt Christ reach out his hand to lift them up. And here's the good news. So can we. So can we. We can feel Christ lift us up if we're willing to get out of the boat. You see, sitting in the boat, we don't need lifted up. We don't need rescued. We don't need help. We can feel Christ lift us up out of the storm if we're willing to get out of the boat. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Do not be afraid to get out of the boat and attempt to walk on the water. For if Jesus calls us, our faith will be rewarded. Is your boat being buffeted by the wind and waves of life? By the ongoing pandemic? By the social unrest currently sweeping our nation? By economic uncertainty? By relationship problems? By aging issues? If you've entered a long, dark tunnel in your life situation, Listen to the Savior who does not even need a boat because he wants a one. Take courage in his eye. Do not be afraid. Let us pray again. Father, we come before you yet again and we praise you that you are the one who walks on the water and bids us come. That you have an adventure for us a venture of faith that will take us to places beyond our wildest dreams. An adventure that will give us satisfaction and fulfillment like we've never known. You've given us all that same call, and yet so many of us are content to remain seated and watch the others. Take that contentment away from us. 
drive us to get up and respond to your call, to step out on the water, to try something new, to walk on the water, to share your gospel. Call us and use us. In your holy name I pray. You'll stand and take your hymnals. Turn to 319 verses 1, 2, and 4 on your cross.